Hi, everybody. Do you think we should start or maybe wait for five more minutes? All right, let's just start with introductions, maybe. Hi, um, my name is Suchi Gar. Uh, I'm working as a technical team lead at Akoya at this moment. And uh, the reason why I, uh, I decided to present on this particular uh, topic was that this is really close to my heart. I have been working remotely on and off since, I think, 2004. And that is why whatever I'm going to present today is not a theoretical thing. It's more of my experiences. Um, uh, one thing I would like you, I would like from you in partic this particular session is that let's make this more of a, uh, not, not a one-way session, let's make it more of a discussion. So anywhere you feel that you have any questions, anywhere you feel you need to interject, please do. And that would be really helpful for me as well. Um, just uh, to get a feel of the audience, uh, how many of you are actually working remotely as of now? <laughs> All right, that's, that's a real uh, good number of people here who are actually working remotely. So, just a minute. So, I mean, when, when we say working remotely, what does working remotely or utterly commuting actually mean? Um, in layman terms, if we say it, work, it can be working from home, working from a coffee shop, working from the library, basically working from anywhere else, anywhere other than uh, a structured office that you have. That is what working remotely essentially means. But if you are looking for an official definition, um, so telecommuting is a work arrangement in which the employee works outside the office, often working from home or at location close to home. It can be coffee shops, it can be libraries and other locations. Um, essentially, there are no defined types of work from homes, but the, the, the types, of, uh, types of remote working that I have listed down here are the ones that I have experienced during my last, let's say, 11 years of, uh, of my experience. So this is the first one probably. So all the teammates are scattered. They are, they are working anywhere, I mean, anywhere across the globe, across different locations. To give you an example, uh, my first telecommute job was a startup. And we were four people in there. And the locations were, we were literally following the sun. So we had one in Australia. I'm, I'm from India. Then we had one in Romania and one in the US. So essentially, we used to joke about the fact that the sun never sets, sets on our, our company because the sun is like literally going through. And we had to literally play tag team. But it was just four people in different, different locations, different time zones. And that is one type of um, telecommute. The other type of telecommute is like all the team members are in the same geographic area, same time zones, etc. But they don't really sit together. One of the examples was the last company that I was working for. So they have uh, they have a real remote working culture. So we have people from right from the top of India, that is Srinagar, Kashmir, to and if we do go down, we have people from Delhi, from Ahmedabad, from Jaipur, and right on the bottom, we have people from Bangalore. So the, one of the advantages of, that this kind of working has over the one above is uh, there is no time zone gap. So that really helps out a bit. And then another type of uh, thing that we, I have essentially experienced is that uh, the team is divided into smaller teams, and those smaller teams co-work together. They are on locations, but essentially these teams are remotely working. So for example, at Akuya, we have a 25-member team in Delhi, and then we have a, a team in, in the US, the, which are working together. We have our clients in, let's say, the Europe region or the US region, and that's how uh, things work. But 
the the reason that we are sitting here, to, you, you guys are sitting here, is why we want, why remote working is an essential thing today and how we want to uh, make sure that it, it is a successful, uh, remote working for is successful both from the employee point of view and from the employee's point of view. So before we go there, I, I'll just list down some benefits of remote working. Um, essentially, I mean, if, if I say in, in a nutshell, it's a win-win situation for for everybody. How is it a win-win situation for everybody? I would like you guys to give me some examples or give me, I mean, there are so many people who are actually working remotely here. So, anybody? You were saying that you are a remote worker. How does it that, yes. Right. So, um, sorry, what's your name? Uh, Francesca. Francesca. All right, so as for Francesca, it's, it allows you to be flexible with the time and allows you more time with your family. Right, anybody else? Any, any other thoughts around that? Yep. Totally agree. I live in a city um, in India. The, it's the capital of India, New Delhi. And, uh, I mean, essentially, if, if I'm looking at a, at a workplace, it's essentially a three-hour commute, three to four hours commute easily. So it saves me on that, yes. So just listing down those things, and I'm sure most of you will agree, the moment you think that, no, this doesn't work for me, I would like you to just jump on it. Better work-family balance. For employees, working from home essentially um, offers a better work fa family balance. Some people might not agree with that because being too close with your spouse is also not a very good thing. I mean, living together for 24 hours and being together, being sitting together with each other for 24 hours is not a very good thing. But I really strongly believe that remote working allows us uh, to have a b better work family behavior. Um, to give you an example, I'll give you my own example. And as I said, this is this whole uh, presentation is all about my practical experiences. So I started working remotely in 2011, 2014, sorry. And I was less than 30 years of age, but my commute time was more than three hours per day. I had a young child. She's, she was six at that time. She needed me around, but I was just too tired. Just too tired to enjoy my life, just too tired to sit with my kids, just too tired to cater to my family. And then, I mean, I got an opportunity to telecommute, and uh, um, frankly speaking, it was a big, big risk. In India, in 2014, nobody knew what telecommute is. Nobody expected that a person can actually work from home, do some legal work, and earn money. And it was a big risk for me as well because I had not met the, the person who was offering me employment. There was no Indian entity that they have. So I was worried, okay, if, what if I work for one month and they don't pay me? But that was a risk I just took. And I, I'm happy that I took that risk and thankfully it paid off. But work-family balance is one of the biggest reasons why telecommute is becoming the end thing nowadays. Another thing is, of course, flexible timings. So I might want to, sorry? So um, I might want to like start my day at 8 o'clock. Somebody else wants to start his or her day at 10 o'clock. Telecommuting is something that allows you that. Uh, at times, nowadays, thankfully, most of the offices don't really force on a um, strict office timings. But still, we do have, especially in India, we have a lot of offices which have a punch-in and a punch-out calendar, uh, punch-out uh, whole sculpture. So you have to be there at 9 o'clock. If you're not there by 9 o'clock, you reach there by 9.30, for example, you are half day vacation. I mean, they take it off from uh, as a half day for you. And that kind of culture still exists, exists in, in many companies. But telecommute allows you to get out of that. Financials. We did say that, yes, we save uh, a lot of time in traveling, but we do save a lot of money as well. 
Traveling to and from office is not, not easy, not, and, and it's, it doesn't come for free. Uh, so we have maybe the petrol, diesel, or whatever gas cost. We have um, maybe a train cost, whatever. And let's not talk about just the cost of traveling. There are there are incident, other incidents also. If I'm, I mean, if I'm going to the office, I have to, I mean, make sure that I I'm wearing a proper dress. I'm wearing uh, proper makeup, maybe. So those costs all, all, also count. I mean, sitting on, anyways, pajamas is always less expensive than a pair of proper pants and suits and, you know. And in fact, pajamas are also not required when you're <laughs> telecommuting. So that's one of the um, major plus points when it comes to remote working, that yes, people save a lot. That's a fact. There was a time um, when I was telecommuting for three, four years uh, on a stretch. And frankly speaking, I did notice that I was not buying a lot of clothes because when I'm sitting at home, I don't really need a lot of clothes, but when I have to go to the office every day, that is a saving. Whether you, I mean, you might not think of it as a saving, but it actually matters. And the biggest, biggest, biggest reason for me, today for every one of us, I think time is the biggest cost for everybody of us. And if we are saving on time, yes, we are saving uh, saving a lot, and that is, so for employees, these are the four major things that come to my mind. If there is something else that any of the telecommuters here, any of the remote working people here feel that, yes, that should be added to the list, please do tell me and, you know, yeah. Sorry? I didn't get it. Huh? A place without other people to work in silence. Silence. Peace of mind? <laughs> silence. <laughs> yes. Um, that is, I, I would say that's a two-way thing. Some people want that. Some people don't want that. But yes, so people who work better when there is calm around them, when there's silence around them, yes, it really works. Because at times, offices are so clattered and so chirpy that you don't really get a lot of productivity out of it. Coming on to productivity, why is it, why is telecommuting a good option for employers? How many of you agree to this? Thank you. Why don't you agree? <laughs> to the people who haven't really put their hands up, I really want to ask, why don't you agree? Because um, if, if an employee has a better work-life balance, if he's saving in financials, if he's saving in time, he's happy. Naturally, happy employee is a productive employee. And for employees, I think that is the biggest, biggest, biggest plus. Like you just said, silence, increase in productivity. I mean, in an independent study, it was seen that 53% of remote workers actually worked overtime as compared to only 28% of non-remote workers. And that, I mean, this is one, just one of the stats which shows that uh, remote working does increase the productivity a lot. I don't know how many of you have actually seen this, but if I am in, let's say, I, I'm in India, I'm in Delhi, and if I limit myself my company only to the, uh, if I limit myself saying that, okay, I'm going to hire only people who will come to the office. So essentially, I'm limiting myself to people who are available in the Delhi area, or maybe who are people, uh, the people who are willing to relocate, right? So essentially, I'm, I am limiting my talent pool. But the moment I open up to, the, to an option of remote working, my talent pool explodes like anything. I'll give you my example. I have been working in Drupal for the past more than nine years now, but I cannot move. I just cannot move. So the company that wants to hire me either has to be in the Delhi area, or they have to have, uh, offer me, if they really want me, so, or they have to offer me a remote working option. Otherwise, I will not be able to join them. So this is a very simple thing. There are so many companies now that offer remote working. So essentially, I mean, I'll give an example of one of my earlier companies. Um, 
so we have i was working in delhi we have alia here she was working from srinagar we have we have a person working from australia we have a person working from syria and another one working from japan because we found the right people the right mix and we didn't have to limit ourselves geographically this is a big plus for the employers and of course financials our aquia office in boston downtown or i mean think of any any location any prime office location it doesn't come cheap it doesn't come cheap at all and so having not having a physical office just having a virtual office does help a lot in the financials in the in the financials of the company there's no need to invest in office space there's no need to invest in furniture there's no need to invest in infrastructure like let's say the internet connection phone connections etc 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 and that does save a lot so uh yeah sure agree so so what you are sorry sorry uh, i didn't get your last last line from the employer point of view yeah so uh, when uh, yes i do understand that there's a difference between self employed and remotely working people and people who are working remotely for a company but then again what you are essentially saying is that working remotely is also a an art that not everybody has it doesn't i mean it's it's a culture that needs to be developed and it's it's something that and that is what we will be coming to in later in the in the presentation because everybody is not suited for remote working and there is some, there are some things that you need to do to be successful as a remote worker as well as a remote employer and that's what we will be touching base on so i mean is every job suited for remote working sorry no answers is every job suited for remote working <laughs> some very simple examples of jobs not suited for remote remote working a cab driver <laughs> any other a cleaner, a cleaner yes a uh, i would not agree with that i would not agree with that a teacher can be remote sorry um things are changing there <laughs> i have seen people doing remote surgeries but yes i do agree with you so not every job is suited for uh, um, and i don't think i need to really expand on this there are certain jobs but f i think for most of the people who are working here we are drupalers we are working with technology and for most of us i think remote working is an option i would say so coming back to the point uh, that you raised sorry i don't remember i don't know your name coming back to the point that you raised so who is suited for remote working this is where we'll be talking a bit about uh, from the hiring perspective that if as an employer uh, or as a person who has just started a startup i'm looking for people and what kind of people i should be looking when i'm looking for remote people make sense working in an office is a lot about working but it's more it's a lot about having a social workplace as well water cooler talks going let's go for a coffee i mean general chit chats so a remote worker a person who will fit this role is a person who is okay without a social workplace i think that is one of the one of the key uh, criteria
we are not physically exactly. present at the same place, but almost at any time of the day, exactly. than someone online. Yes. Yeah, so I should probably rephrase it a bit, saying without a physical social workplace. So yes, a virtual social workplace is a must if we have to have, a, let's say, a, a good remote environment in the company, in the in the wherever we are working. A remote social workplace is a must. But what essentially I'm saying about here is uh, a physical uh, social workplace. Hire doers. See, um, propensity towards action is really, really important. Um, this, this is a type of person that, I mean, if he doesn't have a task list, he'll find something to do. And I'm sorry, I'm saying he. I should say they to be more diplomatic here. <laughs> Myself, um, I should not be saying that, okay? So this is the type of person they will find something to do. They don't have to have a task list. They don't have to have somebody standing above their shoulders and, you know, keeping a, a tap on what they are doing and what, uh, are you done with this? Okay, here's the, the next task to do. Here's the next task to do. No. They'll find something to do. If they don't have something to do, they'll go to their managers. They'll go to their uh, peers and figure out something to do. People who are able to prioritize. At times, and I'm especially talking about teams where time zones is a big concern, I have two, three tasks in my hand, and I don't have anybody whom I can talk to about prioritization. But I know about the whole project. Let's say in a project environment, I know about the project, so I should be able to prioritize, or I should make sure that the day before I have already talked to people who know what to prioritize, how to prioritize. It's very important. This is, I think, a really, really important trait to have. We need people... Uh, remote people who are successful are essentially people who can write well. And the reason is that most of the remote communication doesn't happen. Uh, you just go, don't go to a person's, you know, a cubicle or a person's office and say, hi, I have this issue, let's talk about it. No. You either send out an email, uh, an IM, uh, or, or something like that. So unless and until you can write properly, unless and until you are able to explain yourself in a nice manner, and, you know, it, it, it becomes very difficult to be uh, uh, able to communicate, uh, to be able to put your thoughts across. Um, if someone struggles to write clearly and concisely, they'll naturally struggle in a remote team. And that's what my experience has been. One of, uh, one of very important aspects of this, uh, of writing, is that often an email uh, or an IM or, or, or a message can also sound very curt and very, you know, rude. So we have to be cognizant of that fact and we have to make sure uh, that we write accordingly, make use of a lot of smileys, maybe emoticons, etc. But it's really important because in verbal communication, uh, what we are saying is important, but the tone is also really important. And that is what we lose in written communication. And that's what we have to really cater to when we are focusing on, uh, on a remote team. And I think one of the most, most, most important uh, aspects of remote working is you need to hire somebody who is trustworthy. Uh, from whatever my experience has been, trust is a golden word when it comes to remote working. Unless until, and it's not just a one-way street. You, the employer needs to, to trust the employee as well as the employee needs to trust the employer. And so when you're hiring, um, when you're, let's say, taking the interview, for example, there is a sixth sense which does tell you that, okay, this person is not trustworthy. Do listen to that. Six cents. That has really helped me a lot when I, ha I have been hiring in the past. And um, last but not, not the least, I think this is something which is sort of related with the first point. Because of the absence of uh, a physical uh, social workplace and physical social 
infrastructure. I think it's important that they have a lo local support system. It can be a, uh, it can be a technical support system. It can be their family support, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so that the person doesn't feel lonely. I have seen people who who lose uh, their who literally lose their sanity. I mean, because of the fact that they don't have an, a proper interaction with people. They don't have people around. So if they don't have people around, it becomes at times I've seen it become a become a concern. Anything uh, you guys might want to add, please. Yep. Like when you talk about trustworthy, how does that differ from a like classic legacy company? Don't you have to hire trustworthy people in there? I, I, I don't deny that, yes. But, um, uh, yes, I mean, yes, it's important to hire a trustworthy person when you are in a physical uh, a thing, uh, that kind of environment as well. But, you know, um, in a physical environment, you still have that option to be able to keep a constant check of that person just staying with him, sitting with him, being on top of him, always. But, um, but in a remote environment, that's just not possible. So it, it becomes, I would say, having a trustworthy person is a, in a physical, actual office uh, is important, but it's even more important when it comes to building our remote teams. That's the point I'm trying to put here. I'm not saying that trustworthy is not needed. Yeah. I agree. I agree, and I, frankly speaking, I don't have an answer to that. Sure. I have an answer to that. I just want to promote, um, in my current company from 2008, and essentially remote since 2000, uh, jobs that are suited to being done remotely generally can and should be measured by deliverables. You don't need trust when you say, Does that answer a bit? Yeah, yeah I mean, I do totally agree that trust is not something you can, you can trust, you cannot trust a person with just, let's say, two interviews or two meetings. Yes, it builds up over time, but this is one of the traits that we should be looking out for. Ouch. Uh oh, sorry. I don't know what I did. Sorry for that. So coming back to our main thing here, how to make it work. And my answer to that is number one, communication, number two, communication, number three, communication, number four, communication, and number five, communication. Because I think that is the one most, the five most important things that we need to have. Communicate, 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 communicate. Regular communication. Now I'm just trying to be nitpicking here. So regular communication. Make sure that your teams have a regular meetup, a regular, let's say, a stand-up meeting every day, uh, you know, so you do meet regularly, and you do communicate with each, each other on a regular basis. It doesn't depend what you talk about, but it's very important. Having an official time scheduled 
I mean, it, it's really important uh, on, you know, in a remote team. Communication, proactive communication. Um, so I am a remote worker, and I just saw a piece of code. Again, I'm a developer, so I talk in terms of code. Uh, so I see a piece of code written by somebody else, written by somebody else, let's say, one year down the line. But I feel that this piece of code is going to come back and bite us in the future, right? This is just an example I'm giving. It, it is my responsibility to go ahead and bring that up in the team, bring that up to my manager, to the team as a whole, to the person maybe who wrote this code or whatever, even though it's not a problem as of now. So proactive communication is really, really important. This might be a problem later, so let's talk about it a bit now. Of course, reactive, reactive. So I deployed to production and the production went down. <laughs> this is reactive communication, we have to talk. We have to talk in that. <clears throat> and frequent communication. Talk to each other frequently. Even if you have a regular schedule, doesn't mean that you have to talk to each other only at that time. Keep on talking on a regular basis. So basically, what I'm saying is that in a remote I mean, setup, there's nothing like over-communicating. Because, because of the fact that when you're co-located in a team, you, know, you gain an incredible wealth of contextual inf information about your teammates just by being around them. So I mean. They, those details might seem superfluous when we are talking uh, or talking about it, but they, it, it really helps us uh, out in understanding the team, understanding how they are working, what they are working on, just by being around. But because of the fact that you are working remotely, that is something that you don't really get. And that is where this comes in. Just talk, up, talk remotely. I mean, there have been cases... Um, where, I mean, we just shared a video of, you know, a dub smash video of uh, one of the friends, one of our team has just shared a dub smash video of uh, their wives saying some Bollywood dialogue. And just like that, I mean, that, that's what, what I mean when I say communicate just like that, because I just wanted to share it. It's, it doesn't make sense when we talk about a team as such. It's not important project-wise, but it's important to understand the people that you're working with, and that's where communication comes in. And whenever we have that richness of context by being around, that is where trust building starts. So that is why it's important. The five communications is, is something that we really need to have. So in remote teams, communication is, I think, one of the most important things that we, you know, have to have. Yeah. Um, I might not be uh, an expert at that, but I can, I can tell you how that works for us, let's say. So at this moment, I, I'll explain to you about our current scenario. We have a, a small team in India, Delhi. Uh, we have like six, six, seven developers, a manager, you know, kind of a team. And then we have a US team as well. So the regular standards that we have is we have, a, I'm talking about, a, I'm talking time zone wise, I'm talking Delhi time. So we have a morning stand-up with our team, and we, you know, take the updates and we talk about what needs to be done today, what was done today, what was done yesterday, and is there a blocker? Just a 10 to 10 minute stand-up, not more than that. That's the way we go about. And then in the evening, we have a stand-up with our U.S. team as well, in which the whole team in Delhi and the whole team in the U.S. participates, and then we talk about. Uh, all these things, which was which, whatever was accomplished today, what are the priorities for tomorrow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sorry, uh, I, I am not able to hear you. Um, that is something I'll be covering a bit in tools, and then we can talk about that a bit more on that.
Да. And I would say this is not a, a problem, the problem that you just raised. This is not a problem just in remote teams. This is a general problem in any kind of office. I mean, in offices, there have been times when we have to take a call. And the office is just too noisy. You can't actually take a call. You have to really go into a conference room, shut yourself up, and maybe take a call. So this is more of a general problem. And I do agree with whatever what the solution is. It, it, this is a, let's say, a solution. There's no fixed solution for this. This is based on the teams, and this is based on the, um, the kind of environment, the kind of setup you have in. Yes, but yes, that is one of the solutions. Yes. And which is arranged ad hoc, and everybody agrees to a particular time, and then they are available at that time. But other than that, it's as as you said that it's more asynchronous. So the other person responds as and when they are available, as and when they are able to answer. So he might. They, we we are developers, and we go into a zone at times. We don't want to be disturbed, and at that time, a Skype ping or a Slack ping can be disastrous. I do agree to that. So again, it depends from team to team, from a person to person, and how they want to manage it. But it's a team decision, I would say. All right, uh, remote working. Some very, very important stuff. And you won't believe, I mean, this might sound obvious to many of the people who are working remotely, but you'd be surprised at, I mean, how many people and uh, who want to work remotely, they don't really miss, and they don't really check all the boxes here. The biggest, biggest requirement for everybody of us. If our internet is not working, we are not working. And this might not seem to be a big problem from, for people who are from US, maybe from Europe. In India, it's a big problem. It's a real big problem. So there was a time when I was working remotely, and I had three different connections. So a backup, a backup of backup, I mean, a, a main connection, a backup, and a backup of, a backup, of backup. Because that's what happens. Um, the, the connections are not stable. So unless until you have a stable internet connection, you cannot be a good remote worker. This may or may, as I said, this may or may not be required, but as uh, she had just pointed out, that peace, I mean, and quiet and silence is, is one of the most important thing. But what if you have a two-year-old toddler, and <laughs> then that silence is really difficult to have. So you would need to have a separate room, a separate corner, uh, where you are, you can work, you know, uh, that's, I think, really, important. You won't believe how many people don't agree to that and don't have that, a good headset set with speakers. I have been on calls with people, I mean, they take a call just without any headset and without any speaker, and then it becomes really difficult to understand. They're not able to listen to me. I don't, I, I'm not able to listen to them. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to put this here because just to put the point across, I know most of you are already working remotely, and most of you will have all three of these, but I think this is very important. Now we'll be coming to the tools that we were, we, uh, I said I'll be coming back to. Um, what are the tools that, are really, that really work for a remote setup? What are the tools that really make a remote team work properly? A very, very good chat tool. A chat tool which offers you calls, which offers you video calls, is preferable. We currently use Slack, but Skype has worked for us very well. At times, we do switch to Google Hangouts. 
Slack is Slack has an integration with Google Hangouts for video, so essentially we use Google Hangouts a lot. Some people uh, use, you know, Campfire. Whatever works for the team, but it's it's imperative that you have a single chat tool which uh, which everybody is on because we don't want hundreds of different channels. Uh, I have also mentioned WhatsApp here. Uh, I don't know if many of you know what WhatsApp is. So what's, what's you do okay. So essentially, WhatsApp is a phone application. It works on the phone, and that is essentially what we use within our team to connect, but mostly for non non project and non work stuff. So, like I mentioned, when when we are sharing our Dub Smash videos, that's that will probably go on a WhatsApp and not on the Slack channel. That's just a normal code of conduct that we follow. As I mentioned, a good video, video tool, video conference tool, and I, I would like to point out we are, we are saying conferencing tool and not just a video calling tool. The reason here is that at times we, there's just not one-on-one -on -one communication. There are five people calling up. For example, the standards that we are having, if we, if we have to have a good video conferencing tool. Skype, Google Hangouts. And it really helps if it, ha if it has a screen share option because at times, um, I'll give an example. So I'm a developer and I fixed a ticket, fixed a bug and gave it to my QA. Now the QA is saying that it's not working. It's not working, this just doesn't help me. And they say they are able to reproduce it with certain steps. So if they have a screen share option, they, are sh they show me the, the steps that they followed or maybe I get them, no, you have to go there and not there. That's where screen share really helps. Project management tools. In Acquia, we use Jira. In my earlier company, they had a, uh, a home-based, homegrown version of Redmine. Some people use Basecamp. Whatever works, but it's important to stick to a project management tool and make sure that everything is there. Because it's in a remote team, it's very important to keep on document everything. When I say document, I'm not talking about uh, writing down a big documentation about anything, no. What I'm saying essentially is that, okay, so there was a bug. I had a call with my QA about that bug. Whatever was discussed there, that needs to go into Jira because it's important to have uh, uh, the whole flow of whatever was discussed. Jira for us has really worked well. I don't know if, I mean, for others, what has been working. Um, document sharing, Google Drive, Google Docs. I think this is something almost everybody here would be using. This is a big question mark probably, but for us, for, docu for our development tools, for our develop developers to be able to share code and work collaboratively, GitHub has been helping us a lot. Um, there are some other tools. GitLab is a sort of a GitHub version on, on, uh, only, and that has also helped a lot of people. But for us, GitHub has been working really well. I think this is a really, really important um, tool to have. So for example, I want to discuss a certain feature that needs to come in the next sprint, or I want to organize a sprint planning meeting. Google calendars allows me to be able to look at the agenda of everybody to the calendar of everybody and be able to schedule a meeting based working around their you know, schedules. Um, this may or might, might not be useful for some, but uh, for me, Evernote is really, really important because that's where I, I manage my own to-dos, sketch for you know, uh, screen sharing and screenshots, et cetera. And if you are in a team which, with varied time zones, this is really important. Um, I live in Delhi, Indian time zone, so, and my our US team, some of them are in Portland, some of them are in Boston. Uh, we have a project which is running in um, England. So, I mean, I'm talking about just four time zones here. Then we have a team member who's in Australia. The moment five different time zones comes in, 
Calculation of plus 12.3 and calculation of plus 5.33 is a nightmare. So a good time zone converter clock. Uh, in fact, uh, on my uh, on my uh, machine on Chrome, I have an app. Uh, I have a plugin installed which, uh, on a blank sheet, uh, whenever I open a new tab, it gives me time zones of five different places, which I'm really concerned about. Any other tool that you guys have used that you feel is really helpful when? Sorry? Trello, yeah. So uh, Trello would be, uh, I think it would prob probably come in a project management tool kind of a thing. Trello is a, is a really, yes, some, for some people Trello has worked. Then we have other versions of, we have Asana is something that some people have worked on. There's so many things. So I just mentioned what I have worked on and what has been working well for us. But yes, Trello is a tool that many people have used. Sorry? Oh, Wonder. I don't know what that is. If you could explain, that would be great. Awesome. So wonder list. That's what you're saying, yeah? Okay. Great. I saw another hand. Yep. Uh, they are, uh, I would not say for actual estimation, but for grooming of tickets and for planning of a sprint, yes, there are tools available. So uh, I don't know um, um, if you have heard of you know, like planning poker. So there is a website which actually offers something like that. Uh, I can give you a name of that. I'll, uh, one of our teams uses it. I have not used it, so I don't remember that. But there is for planning poker specifically. There's already then for retrospectives. For example, we have essentially three things when we are doing a retrospective. What is going well? What needs to what? what should stop, what should start, and what needs to continue. So for retrospectives also, there is a tool which offers something like that. So yes, there are tons of tools available. Again, it depends from team to team on what works for well for you and your team. And this was just an example of, so as a manager, as you were saying, when we were talking about um, Jam, as you were saying, when we were talking about trust, this is where you know, having a specific work plan and having a certain milestone kind of a thing, uh, task list, and that's when you keep on tracking those, uh, when you keep on tracking your work plan, that's where the trust starts building. So this is really important as an employer or as a manager who's managing a remote team. Uh, it's even more, it's normally, uh, uh, to put that, uh, in a physical workplace, yes, having a work plan, plan is important, but it's more important when you are in a remote team because you have to keep on tracking stuff, yeah. Yes, I agree that. I agree on that because when you are trying to hire a person, you don't know how trustworthy it is, but you have to go on your gut feel on that. Very important. As an employer, as a manager, you have to make sure that you have a regular face time with each and every person. Just a regular stand up of 10 minutes per day doesn't really work. Because you have to understand what your employees or what your team members are feeling. And um, in, a, in a normal workplace, that these kinds of things come to you from tone of a person, from uh, nonverbal communication. But for remote teams, this is what is really important. Yeah, video calls. Video calls, not slang on a plane. <laughs> I don't want, I mean, on one point we are saying we are saving, and then we are flying people across. That would not be saving. Uh, this is sort of a correlated thing from number two. 
again, it's not easy to be an employer of a remote team. It's not easy to manage a remote team because of so many non-mobile forms of communications that are absent. So this is, we have to be aware of what is team expecting. We have to set the team's expectations correctly. And that's where, again, communication and a regular communication comes, becomes really important. As a remote team member, that was the employee's, employer's perspective, how, what that guy needs to do. And for, as a remote team member, how can you be an effective remote team member? I think this is one of the most important aspects. Being at home, it's very easy to slip into the you know, an undisciplined thing, saying, OK, I need to log in at 9. Let me log in at 9.30. And tomorrow it will be 10. It, and the next day it will be 11. So it's important that you have that kind of self-discipline and self-focus to say that, no, I need to be online at you know, 9 o'clock because I need to do this kind of work. It's more about discipline and self-responsibility, awareness, awareness of responsibility. Feedback. Don't be shy when giving feedback. And, don't, and try to take, take feedback constructively. So both giving and taking of feedback is really important as an employee. Be available. When I say be available, I don't mean that you're available 24 hours. But what I mean is that you are working remotely, yes, but you have to understand that you're working in a team as well. So be available for the team so that if they have any questions for you, if they have any clarifications, they're able to clear that those things out, up. And the next thing is understand the impact. So the moment you're unavailable, the moment you are, you decide to play hooky and you decide, no, let's, let me not work today and let me go for, um, go for some tourist thing or whatever. It has an impact on your productivity, yes, but it also has an impact on the, the productivity of the team as a whole because it does happen that uh, there is the, some certain team member is looking, is waiting for a feedback from you. So it's important to understand if I'm not available during this time, what is the impact of that on my whole team? Um, as an employer, as a company, for example, Akoya, it's important that regular FaceTime is arranged. We have regular retreats. We have, uh, we participate in events where people can meet each other and you know, we can connect actual faces behind the thumbnails and behind the videos. Uh, we, I mean, for example, in Akoya, we had a retreat, the India team retreat in Goa in April. Then we are meeting, we are flying to Boston in October. So all these things are really important. Also, it is very important to, uh, with the tools, I mean, they sh the company should provide the tools, but the processes. For example, when an, a new remote employee joins, it's important for them to not feel like orphans, literally. It's important to have a certain culture, a certain, certain process in place so that they have, let's say, maybe a buddy culture. So whenever a new person joins, is they have a virtual buddy who will be taking them across and, you know, across the whole system. And, I mean, that's... that's um, one of the unconventional ways I found was, you know, to feel connected. Turn your web webcam on the whole day and let it just. So it this sort of a everybody anybody can come in and say hi. I saw that in the in our Akoya office in the support thing. They have a huge TV there, and uh, people have their webcams connected. So anybody just, can just go and say hi. Uh, this is something that has been. Um, Foursquare has this implemented. They call it the portal. And so the interactions are not pre-planned. They are very spontaneous. And they have a huge Cisco router and this router. But this can be done using a basic webcam as well. And most important, like I said earlier, trust. When you are in a team, you have to trust. As an employer, you have to trust your employers. And as an employer, you have to trust your employees and this. Questions? Uh, while we are looking at, while we are taking questions, uh, just some uh, pictures I wanted to share. Yes.
This is a really tricky, tricky thing to master. I, I mean, I, I would not say I have mastered that. For example, I do take a lot of interviews, and I do ask the the, the interview a lot of technical questions based on what they want to, what based on the place. But I do ask them a lot of non-technical and behavioral questions as well. Um, and frankly speaking, there are no specific set of questions that I ask. It's more about how the flow of the interview is going. And having that, the answer to those behavioral questions really helps me understand on the kind of person that that guy is. Because most of those questions don't have a right or wrong answer. It's just that the way they answer. So I, I'm sorry, I will not be able to really list out uh, a few questions for you. But not only technical questions, behavioral questions are really important when you are taking an interview, especially for remote employees. Um, just to tell you, this was, I mean, uh, we had organized a potluck. So we had potluck as di at different locations because our team was in different locations. So different locations, different potlucks. This was at, in a retreat, and this was a meeting that was happening. You can see who is the only person working there. That's me. <laughs> Any other questions, please? As I said, we have a WhatsApp group, and this is too funny to not share. Yeah, you had a question. Uh, one thing uh, you didn't talk about is, uh, I, I call it the difference between tethered and untethered uh, remote workers. Uh, for us, we have a lot of untethered, uh, so they don't work at home. They travel the world constantly and go to airports and skip from Yeah. And, uh, and those are about the most productive uh, developments, are they? Uh, yes. Uh, um, I maybe agree. It depends, on, again, on the person to person. Some people don't work very well that way, but some people, they want to explore the world, and that's why. Um, but uh, I, I really don't. I don't know what to say about them. I mean, it depends entirely on person to person. Some people, again, I know of a person who has been traveling, I mean, uh, from right from Italy. He, he's an American who's married to a Taiwanese, so he has a home in Taiwan, but he lives in India at times, so he's at stretch, he lives for six months in India, and then he'll plan, okay, no, I want to go to the U.S., so he'll stay three years, three months in the U.S., and then he'll, no, I want to go to Italy and do some organic farming. So people are like that. It depends from person to person. I have seen some people who don't work very well when they have to travel a lot. So it depends again. Any other questions, please? Yeah. I totally agree with that, yeah. So empathy is also really important when working in a remote environment, I mean in remote teams. So you need to understand what the person, other person is, yeah, it's needed. Any other questions? Um, I have had people who have worked part-time and they were remote and they worked well. So I don't think that should be a concern. There were people who were already studying, so, but they wanted to earn, you know, and they worked remotely, so. Thanks a lot for attending, thank you, bye.